What's going on, Clits? What? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy, Dub. It's your boy, Ross. And we're in the clutch, baby. Hey! Back to you, ladies and gentlemen, of the video today, you feel me? Hey, man, we're going to be checking out a Mr. Ballin' video. It's been a minute since we checked Ballin'. out a Mr. Ballin' video. Never ignore native wisdom. This sounds very, very interesting. Yeah. It sounds like a you effed around and you found out type of situation. For sure. You know, there's always people in different cultures. They tell you, hey, don't go over there. Hey, I wouldn't be over there. Hey, don't, don't do spend it. the night there. And, you know. Don't go down that road. It's usually the white folks that be like, ah, we'll be fine. Oh, hush. Why? And then they end up missing. Or they end up with some random unknown disease and mysteriously die. Where's John? <laughs> hey bro, I ain't gonna lie to you, man. Um Mr. Mr. Ballin be messing it up for us, you know, because you know that comment I read on this page is very true. As I do certain things, I'll be thinking like, man, this would be a wild Mr. Ballin story if something happened. So um that lets you know his stories are that dope. His his yeah. uh his narration, his commentary. Mm -hmm. Um he, he got the voice for it. I think he really, really has a very solid he's in his own mm -hmm. lane when it comes to the storytelling, like He's sure. not, but we're finna get into this one right now. So make sure I want to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and let go. Hey, shout out to you, uh, Do Rag Perk, for subscribing at the tier one, man. Yay, Do Rag Perk, subscribing at tier one. We appreciate you. Still not gonna be a mod yet, said. but you know, <laughs> come on, man, you can't shoot him down like that right when he just subscribed. <laughs> you know who Do Rag is. Do Rag be that's why his name is Do Rag Perk Angle for a reason. <laughs> All right, let's get into it, man. Hey, a man named John Randolph was hiking through a remote forest in Colorado. Uh oh. And he began to smell something terrible. Intrigued, he followed the smell until it brought him to this clearing. And in the clearing, John saw what looked like an old campsite. Now, John is out in the middle of nowhere. And so the idea that somebody was camping out out here in what looked like a long term settlement mm. was pretty bizarre to John. And so John walked into the clearing to see what was going on. And when he turned the corner and saw the ground in the middle of the campsite he saw something that at first he couldn't even process it was just so horrible somebody said gg's john but eventually wait the wait wait what he was looking at was real at wait. which point john turned huh? i just said john earlier yeah he got the script y'all i don't but yeah he definitely got the script man it beat him, it beat hey. him john's man let's go ahead and give our early ggs to john yeah you know what i'm saying it sound like john he found something he wasn't supposed to find. Or maybe, maybe it's not a GG's, but we're going to just go ahead and put that out there just in case. It, it sounds like it Damn, may be bro, an early GG. Not a just in case GG. A just in case GG. Is it John Cena? Nah, John Cena can't be seen. He would never be seen in situations yeah. like this. <laughs> Turned around, oh, sprinted there. out of there, and began screaming for help. Oh, damn. But before we get into <laughs> that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, and you come. I want to say preliminary, uh, preliminary GGs. Say that word again. Preliminary. Ah, preliminary GGs. There there we go. Go. Why don't you do that there more often? Just slow down and, you know, get it. You know, you, I don't know, man. I got a little bit excited. <laughs> For the early GG. Watching y'all the same time as AEW. This is a lit Wednesday. To the right place. Appreciate you. Appreciate that's you. all we do, and we upload once a week. So, if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to go out to lunch with you. Three GGs. But once you get there, spend the entire time chewing as loudly as possible with your mouth wide open. Also, <laughs> please subscribe to our channel and turn hey, on be notifications on me. so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. Clearing. <laughs> On the freezing cold night of February 8th, 1874, oh, God, a 65-year-old man named Israel Swan sat around this roaring fire with a big group of men inside of this valley in western Colorado. The men around right. the fire, including Israel, were all gold prospectors, which meant they traveled the western United States looking for gold. But over the past several weeks, this group of prospectors had been trapped in this valley because of all the terrible winter storms. They had these storms coming in that each time would dump up to six feet of snow. But on this particular night, as Israel sat by the fire, you know, enjoying the flames and hearing people tell stories, one of Israel's friends, one of the other gold prospectors, whose name was Alfred Packer. Hey, man, that hairstyle was wild. Man, I was going to say, it was damn. like a, a, a curly back swoop front. Damn, bro, that's what that's the drip back in 
Back then? And he had his legs crossed. Like, he know that shit. He was God killing. damn. That was the drip? Yeah, bro. Damn. I bet you he had all of them, too. <laughs> damn. I've <laughs> never seen drip like that. Damn. <laughs> that, that's that's 1870. Swoosh. Yeah, bro. Yeah, that's the 1800 drip. Hey, baby. You know what I'm saying? Come ride with me on my horse. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Got a couple nigs back there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Couple, couple. Right, right. He stood up and basically pitched the whole group as to why they should come with him and leave the valley right now. Basically, oh. Alfred told the group that, you know, the weather is starting to turn a bit. It's not as bad anymore. You know, the snow's starting to melt. And Alfred said, I know a pathway out of here that will take us out of this valley in just two weeks and it'll bring us right to Breckenridge, Colorado, which was an area that was known by prospectors for having lots and lots of gold. And so Alfred's basically telling them, you know, this is a win-win. We can get out of here sooner and we can get rich. After uh -huh. Alfred made this pitch, he sat back down and everybody just stayed quiet for a second. And Israel, he kind of looked around and watched to see if anybody would take Alfred up on his proposition. Now, Israel knew, unlike him, most of the other prospectors didn't like Alfred. They said oh, he was lazy and difficult. The beard. But Israel felt like that was really not the reason they did not like his friend. He believed the reason other people did not like Alfred was because Alfred had epilepsy, which meant he periodically had seizures. And because oh. he had seizures, it kind of made him a liability for journeys like this, where, you know, the whole group really needs to rely on everybody and everybody needs to pull their own weight. And so they were kind of worried about it's a guy cold. who at any moment could just become kind of useless because he was having a seizure. But for Israel, Alfred's epilepsy really didn't matter. He didn't feel like Alfred was some huge liability. He felt like Alfred was actually very smart and quite bold. And so for him to stand up and make this pitch just kind of felt like in keeping with who he was. He was somebody that wanted to get things done. And, you know, Israel liked that about him. However, just because Israel liked Alfred, that didn't mean he was just going to naturally go with Alfred and do his big plan. But he was at least thinking about it. And as Israel was weighing out man. the pros and cons of, you know, whether or not Chosen. he should go with Alfred, Chosen he happened world. to look across the fire and he saw one of the men, this really big guy, was sitting there looking really serious and just shaking his head slowly back and forth. Like, mm. no, you guys can't be considering leaving. Oh, that, that's the first sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I know these, I know these neck of the woods. I don't think y'all should do that. No, Mr. White Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mr. White Man. I know these neck of the wood. Although I, I should let y'all because y'all claim <laughs> some territory that you shouldn't. But I'm going to be a good chief. And I'm going to tell you. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't do it. Reconsider. <laughs> Being early. And then the big guy stood up and he held out his hand right in front of Alfred, basically telling him, like, don't say another word. And then this guy, while still looking at Alfred, he said, if you leave right now, all of your friends will die. And then this big guy sat back down again and then everybody around the fire just sat there really tense for a few seconds in total silence. The big man who had just spoken was not a gold prospector. He was actually very different than the rest of the people sitting around this fire. His name was Ure, and he was a Native American chief hey. of the watch band of the Ute tribe. Ure. And chief Ure had actually <laughs> saved the lives of everybody, Israel and Alfred included, who was sitting around this fire. Because mm. a few weeks earlier, this whole group of gold prospectors had wound up lost in this valley, which was the valley where Chief Ure lived with his tribe, and he had found them stumbling around on the brink of death with all the snow coming down. And so Chief Ure and his people brought the prospectors some food and water. They oh, that's them real. Set up a campsite yeah. right near a river. And then Chief Ure told them to stay put in this campsite and ride out the winter. And then in the springtime, when the snow melts, it'll be safe for you all to leave. Now, at first, the gold prospectors were only thankful and just totally psyched that Chief Yure had found them and given them this campsite. I Sounds mean, this was right. great. And so they had no problem agreeing to, you know, wait until the spring to finally leave. But now, after several weeks of being kind of trapped in this camp, the whole group was really starting to get restless. They were worried if they didn't leave soon, there'd be no more gold for them to mine. And for Israel specifically, there was even more pressure on him to go out and find gold because he had told his family that this would be his last treasure hunting adventure ever. 
And so he really mm. couldn't go home empty handed. Mm. He literally was. needed the gold in order to continue to survive and take care of his family. <laughs> so when Alfred stood up and broke the kind of tense silence and said to <clears throat> Chief Ure, you know, thank you for your concern, but I am going to leave early and I just hope others. Well, oh, there we go. That's that. There it is right there. You know what I'm saying, there bro, is. like, like he, he already just saved your life. And he feel like, you know, you should assume he is already aware of the area and he knows what's going on. And you still feel like not listening and taking matters to your own hand. I mean, bro, that's a that's a gentleman's GG because yep. it's like triple G. Yep, man. Hey, hey. I'm not you the boxer. Your, your swoosh hair. Good luck, my boy. You got some nice drip, but I don't think that drip going to save you what's coming your way. <laughs> right. Those will come with me. You know, at that point, Israel saw the conviction in Alford, and Israel really felt like he did need to leave now. He needed to get that gold. And so Israel said, you know what? I'll go with you as well. And then after Israel said he would go, four other gold prospectors also volunteered mm -hmm. to leave early with Alford. Chief Ure could tell he was not going to change any of these guys' minds. And so even though he felt like this was a terrible idea, he shifted his focus from trying to stop them to just trying to give them as much information as he could about the area they were going to go into. Mm -hmm. And so he called all the volunteers who'd be leaving early over to him. And then Chief Ure drew a map in the dirt on the ground. And he told Alfred and Israel and the other four volunteers that you have to follow the river out of here. It'll bring you to this mountain range called the San Juan Mountain Range. And mm. you cannot attempt to go over those mountains. You will not make it. You got to follow that river and go around the mountain range. And then once you do, on the other side, there will be an outpost where you can stop, get supplies, rest, and then continue the rest of the way towards Breckenridge. And then after Chief Ure had explained all this, he made sure to mark an X on his dirt map exactly where the outpost would be. And then Chief Ure just turned around and walked over to his horse and rode away. And then shortly huh. after that, so Alfred, Israel, and the rest of the gold. Yep, he gave him the map. And he specifically said, do not try to cross, go over that mountain, because it ain't going to work out for you. Follow the river, and you'll be good if you must do it. And he said, my job here is done. Hopped on his horse. And was gone. <laughs> this, is, this is his third time. First time was saving their life. Yeah. Second time was telling them, wait here, ride mm -hmm. out winter. Now, here's the map. All right. My boy Simple instruction. No way this goes wrong, right? Right? Right. No, there's no way they fucked this up. No way. Old prospectors also turned in for the night. The next morning, Israel, Alfred, and the other four volunteers who were going to be going on this journey, they got up early and began packing up their stuff. And as they did, one of the other gold prospectors who had not volunteered to go with them, who would be staying in the valley until the springtime, he actually came forward and said he would help them carry their supplies as far as he could go, you know, using his horse. But at some point, he would need to stop, drop off their stuff, and then they would be on their own. And so the men were very thankful about this. And so shortly after eating breakfast, they were all ready to go and they hit the trail. Okay. As Israel and the rest of the prospectors began to hike their way up and out of the valley, they began to see off of the distance the huge jagged mountains of the San Juan mountain range. But they were careful to kind of veer closer to the north to stay along that river path because they knew they were not supposed to go up and over the mountains. And as Israel trudged through the... Someone made a good point. The only smart ones was the ones who stayed. Facts. They're like, you know what? I'm gonna stay here, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna wait it out. Y'all got it, bro. Go ahead. Let me know what, if y'all find yeah, any gold. Yeah. Send me a fucking <laughs> postcard or whatever. At, yeah. If you, if you get home safe, postcard never came through. <laughs> what happened to your friends? I don't know, man. I, I hadn't seen them niggas in much. Still ain't seen them. Still ain't. They seen froze. Them. <laughs> the snow and a line of men he held on to a coffee pot a metal coffee pot that he kept hot coals inside of this not only kept his hands warm but also if he ran out of matches he could easily start a fire using the coals it was right. an old trick he had learned and so as he's clutching this magnificent warm coffee pot in the freezing cold weather israel heard someone walking up behind him uh -oh. so he turned around and he saw it was alfred and he looked totally miserable way more miserable than israel was and so without even thinking about it, Israel just handed off his warm coffee pot to Alfred. And Alfred took it and clutched it and was obviously so did. thankful. Now, none of these gold prospectors had struck it rich. They were all basically poor. But of all these gold prospectors, 
Alfred really had the least of all of them. Damn. And as a result, Israel kind of felt protective of he Alfred. Was poor, and poor. also, Alfred was half the age of Israel. Alfred was 30 years old. And so Israel kind of viewed Alfred as like a lost kid trying to find his way. Alfred had also confided in Israel that when the Civil War broke out in the United States, mm. Alfred had attempted to join the Union Army on two different occasions because mm. he wanted to fight the slaveholding Confederate Army. But mm. in both cases, All they right. kicked Alfred out for his epilepsy. Ah, but that had not stopped damn. Alfred from tattooing right, on Alfred. his arm his battalion information and his name. And unfortunately, because Alfred could not read or write, he misspelled his damn. name when he gave it to the tattoo artist. And so when he got oh, the tattoo, damn. it did not say Alfred for That's his first flip. name. It said Alfred, A-L-F-E-R-D. Oh, and from that point on, that was his name. Nobody called him Alfred. They called him Alfred. And so this was kind of- What's your name, boy? And then after getting rejected from Alfred? the military, Alfred had kind of bounced around from one job to the next, never really putting his roots down and never starting a family. And so again, you know, Israel just felt like this was a guy who needed some help. And so after Alfred very happily accepted that coffee pot from Israel, he in turn reached into his jacket and pulled out a flask with some alcohol in it. Mm. And he handed it to Israel, almost like mm. a thank you for giving me this warm coffee pot. And then the two friends walked side by side for a while, you know, passing back and forth the flask and the coffee pot. And then by late afternoon that day, when the snow was really starting to come down, the prospector who had volunteered to use his horse to help move some of their supplies, he had finally reached a point where he said, you know, my horse can't go any farther, the weather's too bad. And so he dropped all their supplies and then he turned and headed back down the trail. Good luck. Very likely as these men watched him disappear down the trail, so... they all had the same thought. I just got to suck it up for two weeks to get through this treacherous journey and I will get to Breckenridge and I will become rich. Mm. Everybody wanted to be rich, man. Damn, man. Thank you to BetterHelp and get matched with a therapist who will listen and help. All right, let's see how this, this uh, ends up. Two weeks would pass by and Alfred, Israel, and the other four prospectors did not show up at that outpost oh, that Chief Ure yeah. had pointed out, which was on the other side of the San Juan okay. Mountains. We're not surprised, are we? first official stop right. before they <clears throat> continued the rest of the way to Breckenridge. And then another two weeks went by and still they did not show up at the outpost. Damn, another two weeks. Gone. This is a month. We're going for a month. Oh, no. Oh, Damn, man. bro. And Alfred, he seemed like a cool guy. God, oh. Alfred. But yeah, man. I, I, I'm going to call him by the name he wanted to, wanted it to be. He just didn't know how to spell, man. Well, he okay, tatted bro. it on himself, though. So you Damn, know it's real. Bro. Um, no pun intended. Ah, uh, Sub-Zero guy. Ah, uh, bro, come on. That's fucked up, bro. You laughing, bro. That's fucked and once up, again, bro. Now, you, now you can't deny that you don't be laughing. No, bro. I didn't say it. I said I'm laughing in the sense of that's fucked up. That's a fucked up comment, bro. Sub zero. All right, man. Let's let's see what happened to him, bro. Who said flawless and victory? They didn't show up at any of the other camps in the surrounding. Damn, areas. bro. Now Alfred's big plan for this group was really dependent on the weather holding up. When they left, it was true that the weather was improving. It was snowing less. But within a couple of days of this group setting off on the trip, those winter storms came back with a vengeance and just dumped snow all over the valley and all across the trail Damn, this group bro. had been on in their attempt to leave. But the only people who knew that these men had embarked on this perilous journey was the men themselves, and then also Chief Ure and Chief. the other gold prospectors who had decided to stay in the valley until spring. But even if Chief Ure and those other prospectors knew that Alfred, Israel, and the others were in trouble, you know, they would have no way of helping them or getting to them or even right. communicating to the outside world. They were completely stuck in the valley and basically couldn't do anything. And so in short, it appeared that Alfred, Israel, and the other four men were totally lost somewhere out in the wild, oh, but nobody knew. But that would mm. all change on April 16th, 1874, roughly two months after Israel, Alfred, and the others had begun what was supposed to be a two-week-long journey. That morning, a group of officials who manned the outpost that Israel and Alfred and the others were supposed to go to, 
they were having breakfast in one of the outpost's little log cabins. And as they're eating and talking to each other, suddenly from behind them, the door to the cabin flies open, and these officials, they turn around, and they see standing in the doorway is this totally disheveled looking guy with long hair that's sticking up in the air, and a huge bushy beard, and in one hand he's got a rifle, and in the other hand he's got a metal coffee pot. And his eyes were darting like crazy side to side, and he was clearly in shock, and he was trying to speak, but he just couldn't. This man was Alfred. Oh. And it was obvious to the officials that this man is in dire need of help. And so without even asking him any questions, they whisked him inside, shut the door, got him some food, got him some water, and immediately Alfred's wolfing down the food as fast as he can until he began vomiting, at which point he apologized oh, yeah. profusely and said, you know, I've been starving out in the wild for weeks, and, you know, it must have done something to my intestinal tract. You know, it's probably damaged. But frankly, the officials did not care about the fact that he threw up all over the ground. They were worried this guy was going to die right then and there. And so the officials helped Alfred get cleaned up and put in warm clothes. And then Alfred asked them, you know, do you have any whiskey? I want to kind of warm my body up. And they said, no problem. They handed him some whiskey. And so Alfred mm. threw a couple of shots back. And then after that, it was pretty obvious that Alfred had kind of relaxed a little bit. And then at that point, one of the officials asked Alfred, what happened to you? As soon as Alfred was asked this question, he shut his eyes and kind of grimaced, like even the thought of what had happened to him was just too painful to think about. But after a moment of silence, I Alfred, with his eyes still closed, told the officials that he had been with five men and they were trying to hike their way out of the valley to get to Breckenridge, Colorado to look for gold. But as they were hiking this trail, this huge storm came in and made it really hard to navigate the trail they were on. And so the group decided they would actually cut through the San Juan mountain range. Oh. The thing Chief Ure said, don't do that. Do not go over the mountains. They decided to do that. Oh, just damn. Bro. God. I, damn, damn it. Oh, man. Damn it. Damn it. Just that, don't listen. Them niggas did the one thing he said not to do. They should have just. The, the mo one shit. He's been, well, he been telling things. them not to do things since he met them. Damn, bro, it's it ain't looking too good. It, it's 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 safe to say that the rest of them niggas definitely didn't make it. The question yeah, is, nah. what happened to them? We're about right. to find out, man. But as they were traversing these treacherous mountains, it was clear that Alfred was just not keeping up with the group. And so, unfortunately, they made the decision to leave Alfred behind to die. Uh, he knew he was being abandoned to die. And so he had to watch as his five friends, you know, disappeared That's cold, into the snow. bro. But amazingly, wow, they did Alfred wow. wrong, bro. That's cold. They said, "Hey, man, you got that epilepsy, and it's slowing us down." Wow. That's cold, bro. That's cold, bro. Yeah, dead ass, nah, bro. That ain't. You know, that's that's cold. That's cold. But what Wait, would you do, Alfred though? Alfred did not die. I mean, shit, I ain't gonna leave the nigga to die, bro, if we quote unquote friends. And I'm honestly, if we if we out there, I'm gonna at least listen to the chief, the, the chief that said, don't cross the damn mountain. Even if my friend is he's having a tough time, we're gonna stay the path. We gotta stay the path. At least do that. I ain't gonna Somebody leave. had to go. That's cold, bro. And they Instead, picked out for he would spend the next nearly two months stumbling through the snowy forest, having no idea where he wow. was going, eating roots and flowers and looking for shelter any chance he got. But wow. the thing that really allowed him to survive out in the wild was when he was abandoned by the five others, he was in possession of that coffee pot that had the coals inside of it. Oh, wow. And so at night, he was able to oh, start he still fires. Had it. And then also oh. at one point, he was so hungry that he cooked his leather shoes in the fire and ate them because, again, this guy is starving. Bro, you got to be that's hungry. hungry. Yeah, that's hungry. To cook your own shoes? Leather shoes on top at of that. that bro, this nigga, that's wild. You, I mean, you'd be surprised what you do if you ain't got no other option. Damn. What does that taste like? I don't know. But I don't think we want to know. This nigga cooked the, the, the fucking 1800 uh, 7s out there, bro. Like, like the barbecue or something, right? Damn, bro. Some, some leather barbecue. Damn, that's wild.
thing. And so really, he was on the brink of death when he randomly stumbled into this outpost. Shout out to Mini Raiden, 20 people. After Alfred finished telling hey, the story. Man, we appreciate you. Appreciate you, Mini Man. Mini Portable. Yeah, yeah, shout out to her. Oh, that's the person I uh had did a uh live stream with a few weeks back. Oh, Wrestling Snapping Creator, yeah. So shout out to you, appreciate you. On, Mini? Appreciate you for joining in, man. Officially meet. Yeah, <laughs> you stupid. The officials were just totally shocked and Somebody said no bread, no water, just Alfred shoes. eventually would ask them a question. <laughs> he would say, Have any of my men come through here? Did anybody else survive? And they would say, No. It's only you. We have not seen anybody else. Damn. Now, the officials did not say send out no. away, mostly because it seemed kind of obvious that Alfred's uh -uh. men were likely dead by this point. It's been Damn. months since they started that journey. You know, the chances are just not good that they have survived. But even if these other men were not dead yet, the officials had no idea where to begin their search. They knew mm. that if they actually wanted to go looking for these guys, they would need Alfred to lead the search because he's the only one who knows where they could be. But Alfred was not healthy enough. He to called go him out Alfred to too. Mm -hmm. And so for several weeks, Alfred just stayed in the outpost, resting and recovering. And then finally, when he was healthy enough, he would go out and lead a search party to go find the missing men. But unfortunately, he couldn't find anything. Yeah. So it wasn't until that summer, when all the snow had finally melted, that the mystery was finally solved about what happened to those other men. Uh -oh. On August 20th, 1874, a traveling artist named John Randolph was hiking through a forest in western Colorado, roughly in the area where those other prospectors would have been walking on mm. their attempt to leave the valley. And as John Randolph was walking through that area, he began smelling this horrible smell. Uh oh. And so John uh -oh. followed the smell until it brought him to this clearing. John and followed then in the, the smell. the clearing was what looked like an old beat up campsite. And so, being curious, John walked into the clearing to see who was in this campsite. But when he turned the corner and saw what was on the ground in the middle of this campsite, he froze because on the ground in the middle of this campsite were five dead men all lying perfectly in a row. They were the source of the terrible smell. And right away, even though in John was in shock from what he's seeing, he could tell that these five men did not die from something natural. One guy was missing his head altogether, and the other four had obvious signs of something being smashed really hard, probably repeatedly, into their heads. But that wasn't all. The other thing John immediately noticed is that the five bodies were in very different states of decay. Two of the bodies were basically skeletons, but the other three were not. They were basically intact. Their chests had been cut and flayed open, oh, but they all whoa. looked like they had died somewhat recently. In fact, one of the men looked so lively that it seemed like he was just sleeping, despite the gaping wound in his chest and his head that clearly indicated he was dead. Now, John wanted to turn and run away, but he had this morbid curiosity. He wanted John. to know what he was even looking at, you know, what John, happened to these guys. John, John, and so John. kind of against his better judgment, he walked a little bit closer to the bodies. And when he got close enough, he noticed something else that was totally off about the scene. When he was looking down at these men, he could tell that the wounds they had sustained, especially in their chest, looked surgical, like whoever had wounded them, whoever had cut them, had done so with an incredible amount of precision. This was not random hacks that got these guys killed. This hmm. was like a butcher carving up meat. And then John happened to look up from these five bodies, and he noticed just a little ways away was the remains of a burned out fire pit. And then there was a trail that kind of led off into the woods behind the fire. And so again, you know, John, he wants to run, but he can't help but be really curious. And so he walked past the bodies, he went to the fire pit, and he followed that trail kind of back into the woods. And he found this ramshackle shelter kind of tucked away in the woods that was abandoned. No one was in there, but it had all the signs of someone living here for a pretty long period of time. And then suddenly it was like all these pieces came together and John realized what he had just stumbled on. Clearly, those five men had been murdered, and the person who murdered them very likely lived in this camp. And over the course of what looks like weeks or months, this person was butchering these men and then cooking their body parts. Them niggas got cooked. These things turned into someone's buffet out there. God damn. Yeah, bro. Five nigga course meal. Five, five course meal. Five, yeah. Damn, bro. Oh,
The f- oh my god, bro. I mean, oh, the chief told him, don't cross that mountain, bro. They didn't and listen, they, bro. And they, they, they crossed that mountain. They crossed it and they, they got cooked. Legit, like that's not even, you know, the saying, oh, you got cooked. No, they, they legit got cooked. Oh, that's wild, bro. These niggas got seasoned out there, bro. Hey man, you 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 didn't got real dark on these Mr. Ballin videos, bro. Talking oh, yeah, about this, they got season. Oh, this nigga got a nice little drip. Old guy with the drip, yeah. You gonna taste delicious, boss. Somebody said a five for five deal. <laughs> Niggas got sauteed. Not five for five. Five over that three. fire and eating them this is like a cannibal camp and john you know he's thinking is this guy going to come back you know whoever lives here are they coming That's back so well, white people fam. So kind of in panic he pulled out a sketchbook he sketched the area Damn. and then he turned and sprinted out of there to go find help it would turn out john the illustrator was totally correct about what he thought was happening at that camp after alfred was left behind to die those five other men carried on into the night up into the mountains and then somebody attacked them, began Aww. killing them, and eating them. And that person was Alfred. That was why Alfred had survived. Oh, so- no! What, what in the plot twist is going on? Oh, no! This is- oh, you Dog, wanna- what? You want to leave me? Oh, I got something for you. Epilepsy. Engage. Assemble. That's what. Nigga turned into a. (laughs) The villain, bro. Look at this nigga. That's why he threw up. That's why he threw up when he got the real yeah, food. food. Yeah. <laughs> oh, ugh, what is this, man? This nigga didn't eat no leather. Chicken, this nigga man. full of cap, bro. He yeah. eat his, his, his fucking 1801. This nigga was eating everybody else. Boots on they, the leather on they boots. <laughs> this nigga Alfred. Oh. So he what? He killed them one by one or something? Or like they just wasn't seeing so, it coming? That's crazy. Oh, you want to leave me? All right. Bet. Yes, okay. and this nigga just in the snow, just watching, waiting. Oh, I'm gonna get you, niggas, with his cup of coal. <laughs> God, probably hit him over the head with the coal. <clears throat> ah! That's wild, Alfred. What are you doing? This nigga in a whole trance. I'll show you. <laughs> Damn, bro. It's the epilepsy, man. He just, oh, my God. He lost it. it wasn't just that he was able to make fires at night. It was that he was able to make fires at night and eat and his friends. Them. Now, no one has ever been able to actually determine how Alfred went about killing these five yeah, men. Yeah, that's what I want to know. When he killed these five men. All we know is that based on the investigation, four of his victims appeared to have been asleep when they were murdered. Oh but the fifth victim, who actually was Israel, the one guy who really liked oh, Alfred and looked out man. for him and was kind of like a father figure to him, he was the only one who showed signs of a big struggle before he was murdered. While Alfred denied killing all five of the men, he said that he basically only killed one of them and it was self-defense and somebody else killed the other four. You know, it was kind of confusing. You know, despite those claims he had, one thing Alfred never denied was the cannibalism. In fact, Alfred straight up told authorities that he grew to really like the taste of human meat. In fact... All right, get rid of this guy, bro. Bro, I, I was, we were supporting Alfred, but maybe, maybe... Maybe the chief knew something happens in those mountains that if something gets into you, like yeah, if something yeah, happens, hunger, starvation gets to you. Starts noticing the dude walking in them leather boots. Oh, <laughs> this is wild! Good. Mm. When they searched that campsite that John Randolph found, they would find the remains of a dead deer that was right near the campsite. But despite it being right there, Alfred never attempted to carve it up and eat it. Bro, that's cold. Yeah, that's so kind of... So you had a deer, like, nah, I don't want that. I, I know what I want. I want the <laughs> real meat. <laughs> so 
cold, bro. He wants the human meat. Alfred Picky. <laughs> That's cold. Alfred. He just kept going back to his stockpile of human meat and eating that. In the end, Alfred was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Damn. But in 1901, when he was 92 years old, he was granted parole. Damn. And right away, I mean, Alfred became survive. a vegetarian and then died a few years later. Yeah, that's why he wasn't eating what he wanted to eat. Us. From the 1800s all the wow. way through the 1900s, Bodman St. Yeah, man. That was, uh, what was he saying on this part? I think this is a different video. Lawrence Hospital think, uh, is one of the largest like, running asylums in all the like his podcast. But in 2002, it was permanently shut down. Yeah, now, nah, this feels like his podcast. He talk, uh, has like Dog. different stories for his podcast. But uh, yeah. Um, damn. This nigga became a vegetarian and then died. That's cold, bro. This nigga. Oh, you, you want to leave me, huh? I got something for you. And then he made it to 92. That's what? That's crazy. That's kind of, that's sick, man. Like That's wild. I was not expecting that twist. I knew something was up when he said he threw up. Like, and then when he explained eating the leather shoes, I'm like, well, that would make sense. That could possibly. No, nah, it didn't make sense. Well, but... yeah, throwing up. It, but Oh, he, yeah. He, with, yeah, with from the that, yeah. he can only eat that plants and stuff. So I was like, all right, but then once this nigga, once you start, the other dude found him, John, found the camp, and you see all the body pieces and, and stuff. True pictures. I mean, I'm like, Drew oh, illustrated bro, it. this nigga really ate the homies. Well, they weren't well, they really homies because they're about to leave this nigga to die, but I don't yeah, know about you So, know, yeah, it's like a kind of like a double edged sword almost. Cause, and then it was crazy is. He became a vegetarian because he couldn't eat the meat he wanted to eat. Basically. Someone said, call Batman. <laughs> Facts. Alfred took bloodline to another level. Nah, this is definitely crazy, bro. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, this one was wild. So, yeah, uh, for sure, for sure, if y'all sure. enjoyed that story, of course, Mr. Ballin is always 100% from the field when he does his, his mm -hmm. story times, bro. Like, ah, he just gets you so invested. It's almost like you can see what's going on. For real, yeah, outside of yeah. the dope edits that they be doing. So yeah. make sure y'all go support him, run up the likes for his page as well, and subscribe. Keep on supporting us. And hey, let us know what other ones we need to check out. But continue to spray love, be love, and be careful out there, man. Listen to the yeah. signs. Peace yeah, out. For sure. Already. If you got a problem, then we got the solutions. And there's no illusion. I made this shit happen. I'm living life lucid. I'm switching my strategies. Now they hate on me cause I'm causing casualties But why are they after me? Deep inside they know they can't handle half of me